YouTube, this is yours truly, Adre the Plug, reporting live with some more technical heat. Make sure y'all hit that subscribe button below. Make sure y'all hit that bell below so y'all can stay notified every single time I drop new technical heat. But let's get into it, man. Let's jump right back into these interviews. I just finished a whole bunch of sponsorship product videos, so definitely go check all of those out. Some of them I never even seen in person, so I thought it was really, really dope. And then on top of that, also did a couple of electronic projects so definitely go check out those previous videos i did but now i'm about to jump right back into all my interview videos where i interview different people all across the country let's get into it roll the clip what's going on youtube my name is sayed mahdi and i i go by sid at work and school and i go by Tassin at home and i graduated from university of michigan with a mechanical engineering degree and right now I am in General Motors as a design release engineer for cameras that you find inside the cars. Um, yeah, also I'm from Bangladesh, so if you're, any of you are out there, please hit me up because I love my country and I'm actually an immigrant, so I, am, I got my feet in both the cultures. What's going on YouTube is yours truly, Dre the Plug, and we're gonna get into some questions that's pretty much gonna bridge the gap to help him actually tell his whole story. So let's get into the first one. So what exactly got you into, you know, being a mechanical engineer? What made you want to actually take that route? Well, it kind of goes all the way back to Bangladesh. Um, when I was a child, I would draw a lot of cars. We're talking notebooks just filled with cars and I'd get in trouble in my school too. It was a private school and uh, my teachers would call my parents like, hey, why are your son's notebooks just filled with half lecture notes and half doodles of cars? Anyway, so fast forward. You know, high school time I had to choose a major and I'm like okay what is kind of similar to what I like which is drawing and sketching a lot and mechanical engineering seemed similar enough and it seemed to pay well too uh, so yeah and then the CAD aspect of it which I figured out when I was in first robotics in high school and I, I was doing my little CAD designs for our robot and that inspired me and solidified the fact a little more that I want to do mechanical engineering and then I got the Gates scholarship which where I explained my situation and my background and a lot of essay writing and I would love to talk about that more on how to effectively put your story out there to get the best scholarships but overall that also helped me choose my uh, major of mechanical engineering which is one of the oldest fields out there and it's very broad and you have more opportunity to have more options as you go into the work field and finally it was University of Michigan and they have a really reputed mechanical engineering program in the country so it was a no-brainer at that point to go that route. Alright sis so tell me what do you feel is the biggest benefit when it comes down to being a mechanical engineer? Well to start off like I said um, it's one of the oldest fields out there a lot of noble nobility associated with it in general and it's also very broad it, it helps you give a more holistic approach to the field of engineering itself there are so many focuses you can do down the line and it starts off with really strong fundamentals that are crucial to being um, a holistic engineer and for example I right now I'm a, what you'd call a product manager for cameras and it is cam digital cameras are very electrical um, electrically intensive parts like we have PCBAs and and circuitry and schematics you have to look at but my major was in mechanical engineering how am I able to lead it because the fundamentals you get from mechanical engineering they're very transferable it will guide you through some of the toughest engineering challenges the the line of thinking you get from being a from getting a mechanical engineering degree I was in the heat and the heart of the semiconductor chip crisis that happened recently that obliterated the auto industry and I was able to navigate through it I, I want to say successfully and I think my fundamentals of having a mechanical engineering degree helped me go through that and a lot of the other leaders of the industry they are they might be in, uh, in the computer science uh, department or could be in something more electrical focused 
uh, industrial engineering focused and a lot of them hold degree in mechanical engineering. So what I'm getting at here is that it's, it's very broad, very applicable, and it's hard to go wrong with the oldest, most, I'd say most noble engineering degree out there right now. And But I will say this, uh, despite if you do choose to do mechanical engineering, please keep a holistic mindset as you move forward. Have a more multidisciplinary approach as you move forward. Do some electrical stuff on the side. Do some coding stuff on the side. Thankfully, U of M, they offer a lot of uh, um, electrical engineering, some electrical engineering courses to mechanical engineers. A lot of my projects were, I'd say, mechatronic based. So I got to learn about Arduinos and coding and all these other multidisciplinary approaches to it. And I also took up, uh, uh, my project was very industrial engineering focused too. So the idea is that, oh, well, this is, I'm going to be a little biased here. Choose mechanical engineering and do everything on the side that might interest you. And I think it'll be fine. All right, tell me about your journey from Bangladesh to the US. Well, okay. I was about to take one of the most important exams you can take in 10th grade, towards the end of 10th grade in Bangladesh. And, you know, we started for five years for this exam. It's accumulation of almost four to five years of studying for one exam. It's called the O-Levels exam. And a couple months, a few months before I was about to take it, I'm all prepared. I'm about to get all these A's and took all the practice exams. And I got told by a letter from the United States Embassy that you got to come to the United States in the next few months or else you'll lose the opportunity to move here. This is an application that was done like 10 years ago from my uncle and we forgot about it. Anyway, so we scrambled up and we just took everything that I had important and two check bags that I was allowed in one carry-on. And I came in the middle of Missouri to live with my uncle. My parents went back, so here I was. And uh, starting 10th grade in the middle of the semester, and in a country I have no idea about other than HBO and Cartoon Network. Not very transferable, by the way, the language from TV shows to people, how people actually speak. So that was definitely one of the bigger cultural shocks I received, just adjusting to the way Americans speak. It's the small things like, you know, you see someone in the hall, you're like, I'm like, what is that? You know, like, apparently that means like you're acknowledging the other person and, you know, so things like that, I had to little things that pick up on, and that was definitely a bigger part of the cultural shock, the, uh, the spoken and unspoken communication. All right, so Sid is also responsible for the auto news. Pretty much everybody throughout the company get like a news report, like a newslettering that's in the email chain where once a week or so, we'll just get an update about what's going on at GM, what's going on at other automobile companies. Tell the people a little bit about that. Yeah, okay, so start off with when I first joined the industry, someone from the industry that I knew, the automotive industry, they didn't know that Lexus was under Toyota. It's this fundamental knowledge base, not just general knowledge like that, but also what's the current events. These are missing from a lot of us. And I don't blame people who are in the industry who are not being up to date because you don't want to spend minutes, hours of your time instead of working, looking at what's happening with the competitors, what's happening in the industry, you know, who's acquiring who. So, but also it is important to know as a company for all the employees, what's happening out there. So me, Patrick Gus, we uh, started, my coworkers, we started sending out these little bites of news to our immediate teams. And it got, it was a hit, people loved it because our goal is that we want to be able to send you the news and it could be read in under 120 seconds. All right, so you mentioned you are one of the rare people who actually got the Bill Gates scholarship. So what did you have to do to actually become a Bill Gates scholar? Right. So this this scholarship application took eight essays to write. So it's, it's really about being able to tell your own story brutally and brutally honestly. So I really had to um, be introspective and go through my experiences and be honest with myself okay these are the struggles I went through now a lot of times I discounted them saying this is it's just how it is it do be like that right uh, but no it's sometimes your experiences they might might be more unique than you might think and that takes a lot of introspection to be able to understand yourself your thought process 
bit of a meditation maybe to see where you stand anyway um so the the idea was that i was able to put my my raw authentic experiences on paper and at the end of the day it was also a little cathartic for me too so yeah it's the authenticity is definitely one of the more more important aspects of when you're writing a high high voltage scholarship essay like the when i applied for bill gates scholarship on the other hand you want to have some entertainment value to your essays too college essays or or a scholarship to say whatever it is like think about it all these people who are checking your your uh, essays they're going through them one at a time and day after day they're just going through them so you want to be able to stand out and how do you do that part of it is I hate to admit it is you need to have some entertainment value to your writing right give them the authentic stuff but also put in some imagery or it, things out there that doesn't it doesn't have to be unique but it has to be a little more on the lighthearted, possibly ideally on the humorous side. For that, I advise you to look at TED Talks, because the format that the TED Talk, uh, the TED Talkers use, is very similar to the way you should be writing your essays. The structure, the way they, the way they mix the serious and the unserious together to form a very coherent story, right? That it has entertainment value also. So yeah, it's definitely very unorthodox, but. TED Talks, multiple TED Talks to get you in the mindset and then start writing your own story based on some of these uh, TED Talks. All right, so tell the people what it's like to be a DRE, a design release engineer. Right, so, okay, the way I put it is there's a portfolio of parts that I have that I own. In this case, it's cameras for now. So we have a big portfolio of camera that goes into the car. Specifically in my case, it's the the surround vision system like you get the bird's eye view from uh when you look at the when you look at the screen of the car it's really cool if i could show you but yeah it's an sps camera and um so the way it works is that um my design release engineer job is i am the owner of all these parts and the way my one of my previous bosses put it is uh, you are the chief engineer of all the parts that you own so that means i have to deal with the part from cradle to the grave right so it could be anything um, the, the cost the requirements are being met the engineering is sound the the customer is not gonna have any problems when they interact with our parts in this case my cameras um, so we make sure that every step of the milestone I make sure it's it's sound and it's covered and we're hitting all the all the major milestones for the development of my product not just the development but launching it into the car so now everything is good and we want to give it to the customer, we want to put it in the vehicle. So now once it's in the vehicle, also I'm still there, I have to make sure that it's, you know, look at the warranty items and make sure that nothing is wrong with it. And if there is, we make continuous improvement. And we, it's like a continuous feedback loop of improvement with the customer in mind. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I have to do from the, at least my overall aspect of the job itself. So, and it's, it's very rewarding, I'd say, because, well, first of all, it's, um, the, there's a thousand tasks because you own every aspect of this part, be it cost or logistics or the supply chain of it sometimes, or any ensuring issue that comes with it in this, in my case, one of the recent ones was the semiconductor chips that were inside my part that were affected by the recent shortage, right? So, yeah, it's just it's it's really one of the key things in this role is that you need to learn to prioritize and how do you do that it's you have to start off with the mindset that with a cus think customer mindset where you are making your decisions based on having a vision on what of having an, a certain level of empathy for the customer as they're interacting with your parts and you use it as a baseline to prioritize each of the tasks so yeah and it's very rewarding like I said because it's you know, I, I used to be a owner of the front end design of the hoods of the Cadillac um, XT4, for example. So when, I, when I'm when i at a gas station park and I see someone pull up in their uh, Cadillac XT4 and I just feel this weird sense of pride, like I I own that part, I, I helped design it, I helped release it into the car and, you know, I think that feeling is worth all the trouble I go through at my work.
All right, sis, so what's your contact information for anybody out there that may want to reach out to you if they have any further questions or any extra information that they may want to get from you? What's your contact info? All right, so you can reach me at Instagram. It's S-Y-D underscore T-S-N. And an email for S-A-M, the number two, and then the name I go by at home, which is T A H S I N at gmail.com. So, yeah, hit me up for any kind of questions or career advice or discussion on, you know, for career advice, especially semiconductors, the uh, geopolitics of it, this, uh, the supply chain and the technology behind it. I'm really obsessed about it right now. Um, otherwise, there is also, I like skiing and soccer or football. My friends at back home are gonna grill me for this one, calling football soccer and cricket definitely cricket i'm back with my roots with the recent cricket tournament i played so yeah any topic yes especially if you're bangladeshi uh, i would love to link up on that aspect there's not a lot of there's not a lot of us here in the united states not enough of us here especially if you're in the similar fields that i'm in so yeah I'm looking forward to connect, connecting with people here and that concludes this video don't forget to comment like and subscribe it really do help my channel when it comes down to the youtube algorithm if you guys have any questions regarding anything just hit me up on instagram hit me up on the gram at dre the plug one two three and then also go check out my other youtube channel this is actually my second channel my first one was called andre classic cuts i basically go in and give tutorials about all types of different haircuts I actually show people how to do different type of things with the clippers that has never been done. And I pretty much go into detail as to why certain things happen. So definitely go check out that channel. Besides that, be on the lookout for my next content that's dropping. Be on the lookout for it because it's coming real soon. And I'm out. <laughs>